So we'll we'll get started. Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Mar Gonzalez Palacios. I'm the Associate Director for Special Collections at the Arts Library at Yale University. And I would like to start by respectfully acknowledging the land I occupy as the ancestral lands of the Quinnipiac, the Pagoset, and other Algonquian speaking peoples. Angelica Gallegos, uh, who graduated in 2021 uh, with a master in architecture, created this map, which is available at the School of Architecture Tribal Land Acknowledgement page. Angelica gracefully, um, gr graciously agreed to let me use the, her work. And I would like to tell you a little bit about what the intention of this drawing. The interpretive map presents interconnected boundaries of tribal land over time and the relationship to the New, New Haven era, area. The orthogonal lines coming from the west, north, and east connect to the center of New Haven's nine square grid and indicate the historical Quinnipiac travel routes that link the Quinnipiac with the Pegossets, Wangung, Mat and Matabaset, uh, Hamonasset, and Niantic peoples. The typography lines above the nine square grid represents Hobomok Mountain, now known as Sleeping Giant. Hobomok Mountain is a landmark and significant place with, uh, within Quinnipiac origin stories and connected with surroundings New Haven typography, uh, topography history. Uh, so just a little bit about the exhibition. Miko McGinty and I first conceived this exhibition in 2019 as part of Yale's commem commemoration of uh, the 150th um, anniversary of women students at the university and 50 years of co-education at Yale College. Um, the exhibition um, got delayed because of the pandemic. But it was uh, meant to coincide with the exhibition, uh, also highlighting work from women from the art school at the, the Yale um, Art Gallery. This exhibition highlights work by women who graduated from the graphic design program at the Yale School of Art. Um, so just a couple of uh, um, housekeeping um, announcement. So we'll have a, a Q&A at the end. So feel free to add your questions to the Q&A function in Zoom and we will collect them and, um, and respond to them at the end of the session. And the session is being recorded and it will be shared on the YouTube channel of the uh, Yale Library. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Pamela Hofman, uh, who will be moderating this session. Uh, Pamela is, oh my God, I lost my <laughs> page. Um, Pamela teaches in the, in the graphic design program. Uh, she's a senior critic and she's also the principal at Pamela Hofman Design. Uh, joining her are uh, Hannah Smotrich, uh, who graduated in 91, and who's associate professor at the University of Mich Michigan Stamp School of Art and Design, and also Yeju Choi, uh, who graduated in 2009, um, and who's a design critic at the School of Art. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mar and Miko and Hillary for organizing this series of panels and especially for initiating the exhibition of women designers at Yale. The work in Luxe Femina and the designers who made it is diverse and compelling and I hope that everybody that has a chance uh, can go see it. The exhibition at the Haas Library expands, as Mar said, the story of the Yale Art Gallery's show celebrating 150 years of women artists at Yale. And I hope it's also a prompt for the art gallery to start collecting the work of designers. So before we begin our informal conversation, I wanted to explain the simple structure uh, tonight. I've organized my questions for Hana and Yeju in three parts. First, we'll look back at their own design education. Then we'll talk about their pedagogical approaches during this moment in time. 
And then finally, we'll look ahead and consider what is next for design education. Before I get to my first question, we decided as a group that it might be helpful to give our audience a quick reminder of the history of design education at this university for anyone in tonight's audience who may need some context for our discussion. So I'm gonna to try to do this quickly, two minute history. So although there were other institutions that offered courses in graphic design, Yale was actually the first in the country to establish a degree program. In 1950, Joseph Albers was chosen by the new Dean of the College of Fine Arts and Architecture. His name was Dr. Charles Sawyer as the university's first chairman of a new department of design. Not without controversy, the Dean's motivation was to give in his words, a rather moribund school, a good shaking up and disassociate the new program from the Beaux-Arts tradition at Yale and at most other universities. Albers was tasked with developing the new curriculum and hiring faculty. And he quickly tapped Alvin Eisenman, who was primarily a book designer, as the first lecturer in graphic arts. Alvin taught courses primarily in typography and the history of type. And he also oversaw the program and coordinated visiting lecturers. In short order, the faculty constituted the most prestigious concentration of designers teaching at one school in the country. And this all took place at a significant time of cultural change, this is the early post-war years. The Yale program was unique at the time as it was directed toward a professional practice uh, during a moment of burgeoning attention on design from the business community. And as a result, the graduates from the program were instrumental in establishing the profession itself, as well as the education of design as they scattered across the country and beyond. Alvin retired after 40 years in 1990 after overseeing the appointment of Sheila de Bretville, his former student, as the next director of design. Sheila returned to Yale from her practice in teaching in Los Angeles as the first woman to receive tenure at the School of Art. Sheila's work, often in the field of public art embedded within city neighborhoods, reflects her commitment to feminist principles and user participation. Her process of asking, listening, suggesting, and, and sustaining has been the foundation of her design philosophy. And as with her predecessor, Sheila arrived at Yale and definitely shook things up in order to address the times, which included the recruitment of a diverse and celebrated faculty, some of which from the design community and some tangential to it. Sheila recently announced her retirement and a search for her replacement is in process. The next leader, only the third director of design at Yale in 72 years, will face a new set of challenges in these unprecedented times, not only for the new definition of design perhaps, but design education. So those challenges, as Hannah and Yeju well know, include increased access to design education, technological advancement, expanding the design canon, the role of the designer in social justice, the impact on design in the environment, the experiment with visual language and the role of theory, collaboration between disciplines and within communities, new strategies for, of research and writing and more. This is obviously a super exciting time for design, but also uh, in specific the design program at the School of Art. So with that, onto the questions for Hana and Yeju. And the first one, as I mentioned, is looking back for a moment. So Hana, I'll ask you this question first and then Yeju, if you can follow up, that'd be great. So both of you have been educated under the leadership of two very different directors of design at Yale, Alvin for Hana and Sheila for Yeju, not to mention the faculty that they chose to collaborate with. When you look back, was there a pivotal moment, a faculty member, a prompt, a course, a text, or even some kind of Yale resource that changed the trajectory of your education and then ultimately your design practice? Uh, thank you, Pamela. And, and um, I do just also want to take a moment um, to say thank you to Miko and Mar for this 
wonderful exhibition. I'm really honored um, to have been asked to, to be a part of it and um, appreciate the chance to, to be in conversation this evening. Um, so I was the class of 91. So um, my class actually bridged the transition. So our first year was Alvin's last and our second thesis year was Sheila's first. Um, so we all had the good fortune, I think, of uh, being a student of, of both of them. Um, although certainly we were, uh, I think, really in Alvin's program. Um, and for me, um, so I, I was actually an undergraduate history major. Um, and uh, my guess is that Alvin's love of history is not unrelated to my admission into the program. Um, but um, his, his sort of philosophy, his concept of the program as, as there always being value of returning to the basics was really critical grounding for me because although I, had some visual intuitive skill sets. I really had no formal training. Um, and Sheila's creative practice, uh, you know, and her, her interest in community and voices and participation was, was in, incredibly significant impact on, on me and my, and my thesis. And I, I think she really helped me um, connect my interest in cultural history to design and understanding that, that it could be embodied and take, take shape through through design and, and design work. Um, you asked for a specific um, prompt. And um, I, I don't know that I can say it changed the trajectory of my career. Um, but I can tell you that it had a big impact. And um, it, I don't know, Pamela and Yeju, you may have had the same prompt. But um, Chris Pullman, in, in one of his early classes, gave us the prompt, uh, can I borrow your toothpaste? And um, it, was, it was kind of a quintessential Pullman, right? It was a little irreverent uh, and, and sort of deceivingly simple, right? So it's, it was like, hey, it was like this sort of off the cuff idea. Um, but actually, it's an, it was an incredibly complex problem. Um, but that complexity wasn't evident at the outset. It was something that unfolded um, as you started to grapple with what he was really asking. And um, as I remember the prompt, and I'm, I'm positive I'm getting something a little wrong, but it was extremely constrained formally, right? It was like eight and a half, 11, black and white, and, and Chris wanted to be able to take it to a copy machine and make multiples. Um, but it was totally open to interpretation. And I think one of the things I loved about this prompt, and I think has remained an influence for me uh, was that it really it really foregrounded the experience of the user um, and sort of long before I knew the term experience design it really shifted my perception from you know what am I making to how will this be used um, and it, it really forced me to sort of move out from around around the position of the designer making this thing and really think about the person who was ultimately going to need um, to work with it, right? And, and how, how would it function in the world? Um, and I, I just think that that's something that I've carried with me, um, both in my own work and, and in my teaching. Um, I promise I'll stop talking really soon. But the other, <laughs> the other piece of that, I think, is that it was, it was kind of a, a, a really interesting intersection of analytical thinking and visual delight. Right, mm -hmm. and being able to integrate those those two parts um, of of being a designer. Well, I know that there's more to talk about that in our second question related to the work that you're doing. But Yeju, you want to take a stab at this? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I. Well, I I I can't just pick one moment it's um so i would say the entire two years really um everything was transformative and and i say that especially because i was coming to this country from south korea uh to study here so it, it meant a new culture, new language, new ways of interacting with people, just sort of new, like learning everything anew on top of all the challenges that, that the students may have in this program. So um, it's 
you know, really terrifying and, but the exhilarating at the same time, um, but definitely, you know, extra challenging. And, um, but I was thinking about that. And I think in hindsight, not, not, not really knowing much and being really clueless sort of in a way helped my work. Um, I, I don't know about when, when Hannah uh, was here, but for, for me, with Sheila especially, you know how uh, in our program, especially in the first year, a lot of what we do is um, unlearning rather than learning. Um, so really letting go and being free of what you think you're supposed to be doing or, you know, all the habits that you sort of picked up, you know, before working as a designer before coming here, um, or all the sort of preconceived ideas. It, it really is about, you know, letting go uh, and, you are really encouraged to pay attention to yourself. You kind of have to become a bit self-involved, right? Um, and, and really how you, you genuinely see the world, how you make things, how you think and all of that, which is not necessarily easy. Like, how do you, how do you break that, right? I, it, it, it almost, it re it really requires a kind of active surrender, mm. kind of. Uh, but I think for me, or to, for someone like me who didn't have much cultural references, right? There, you know, it, it, in a way, I was the only thing I got. I didn't know what was going on, right? So it, it sort of, when you're like really stripped down to that, you kind of have to be really just like facing yourself honestly. Okay, so, you know, and there's just less resistance to, I don't know, being honest, more, more attentive and more curious because, you know, everything is kind of new. Uh, and you don't take anything for granted. You know, nothing is given. You don't even know what's given, right? <laughs> in a way. Um, so in a weird way, I think that was kind of helpful. Uh, being, I don't know, new to the country or new to the culture. And I would say, I'll say one thing about language because I think this is something international students experience. Um, and I certainly went through that, right? Um, it, having that kind of, limitation in your sort of verbal language. Um, I don't know, but it's, um, I think Wittgenstein said the limits of your language are the limits of your world or something like that. Um, I, it really felt that way. It can be very, very frustrating when the level and the depth of your language doesn't match the depth of your thinking, right? Like it, your, your ideas might be really, you know, really layered, but then it comes out all flat and simple and dumb kind of, you know, like it's, it's frustrating. But in, again, in some ways that forces you to be uh, A, extra clear about your ideas, right? Um, and always be mindful of, or like very conscious about whether what I'm saying is being understood. You're, you know, you don't take that for granted, right? Mm -hmm. So that almost becomes like a habit. Um, and then another thing, well, one good thing is that we're in the business of visual language. So when your verbal language is limited, you know, you don't have a choice but to make work that actually does the talking. Um, so I don't know. I'm just trying to put a 
positive spin on the sort of maybe hard experiences that the international students may have. Um, but you know, I think it's true. I don't know. It's it's been a while, but I, you know, I I acknowledge that it is really really hard, but there's a kind of positive side to that. So we just got an email today with some information on it, and it's um, it's on my other screen. 62% of MFA students at Yale, 122 students enrolled in 2021 and 22, identify as people of color, right? So some percentage of that are people who have also dealing with language issues, perhaps. And so that's a big population that, so it's really so great that you shared that, I think, right? That this challenge for you also, you know, was really critical part of your design education in your right absolutely your i mean but oh, but sorry that wasn't really the question that you asked but i think no you like, answered it you said yeah. it was the, the 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 holistic experience right <laughs> was was but, was really powerful to you and i, I just think I, to... yeah i i just wanted to say one thing i mean i think for two years the most important thing for me was really to have that space and time to be kind of left alone to explore your thing, right? It's trying out all your weird ideas and it having people look at your work, listen to what you have to say. It's amazing. Right. It is it is and it is privilege. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Sheila did say this to me, I'm sure she said it to other people as well, um, that it was this time where you could put your fingers on your pulse, right? And when your heart started racing, right? Through when your blood started racing through your veins, it probably was a signal that this was subject matter, right? That was of interest to you, meaningful to you, and it would engage you for some amount of time, right? Whether that was a semester or you know your two or three year experience. So, um, yeah, yeah, on that a little bit. All right, so on to. Uh, on to today and taking a closer look at the relationship between your teaching and your studio practice. My question is, how has your own pedagogical approach and your studio practice changed over, over time? Yejo, you want to start? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, how has it changed over time? You know, not I don't think it's changed that much. Um, I graduated in 2009, so it's been a little while, um, right? But um, I think in the last panel, um, Alicia and Rebecca mentioned this too, but they, they I, I still see my thesis kind of everywhere in, in my practice and in my teaching too, which, Actually, my work and my teaching are, I mean, my approaches to those two things are just the same. They're not necessarily that different. And just as an example, not to, to go into it too much. For example, I mean, I mentioned this because what Hannah mentioned about um, uh, Chris's um, assignment, that's very close, what you said is very close, closely related to my thesis, actually. <laughs> I mean, I guess this is just graphic design. This is what everybody thinks. But um, my thesis was really about uh, shifting the focus from the designed thing to the space between the design thing and, and the viewer, right? I mean, it sounds like it's simple and given, but how do you really think about that when you design, right? So it just means that, you know, even when it's a piece of card, business card, right? You don't design that as an object, but you, you design it as an experience. And it, I guess like at school, it was, it started more kind of literally thinking about spatial experience or, you know, um, physic physical, tactile, kind of multi-sensorial experience. 
but then out in the world over you know over the last uh, how many years uh over 10 i don't know 15 years um it expanded to it's basically the same thing but it expanded and kind of developed into thinking about the context uh that's more uh, for example from a space to a place or thinking about the community thinking about infrastructure meaning both social and economic infrastructure of your project or urban planning or pol even policies and it sort of becomes same thing but expanded into sort of you know a bigger system system in a way, um, including even, you know, simply thinking about when you're working on a project, thinking about a, a sort of mechanisms of how this organization that you're working with uh, is made and how they work, right? Uh, so it's not the, the thing itself that you're making, but it's everything around it. It's, you know, and, and teaching, Two, in a way, I'm, I'm really interested in and concerned with how each student will actually utilize what they learn in, the, in, the, in their own ways, in their own lives. It's like teaching how to ride a bicycle, right? It doesn't matter how, I mean, it, I can't teach people how to ride a bicycle by showing them how I ride my bicycle <laughs> this way, right? Or I can't teach them how, by giving them a manual to read about how to ride a bicycle. I just wanna make that space and time for them to try and fail. And, you know, like I'm, I'm there to give them some kind of framework, some sort of steps and, and attention and care and, all of that so that they can ride their own bicycle or unicycles or tandem bike or whatever, you know, like their own, like doing their own thing. So eventually without me, you know, being able to do that, I, I yeah. So it's, that's kind of related to sort of being interested in the real lives of graphic design, the real lives of things. Well, Hannah, you're shaking your head because it's so much related to your your work and your teaching. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I, um, I share share many of those same those same sort of thoughts as you about sort of the ex the expansiveness, obviously, of our, our discipline in general and shifting shifting in that way. Um, I think another another aspect, sort of part and parcel with that, is that I, I think both my practice and my pedagogy has also grown increasingly collaborative as well. Um, and I've, I've grown to understand what collaboration means, I think, um, in, a, in a different way. Um, uh, and again, the, the first panel, I know there was a, a conversation about sort of figuring out who you are and how you like to work. So I've, I've really discovered that I, I thrive when I am um, working sort of out loud with, with other people. Um, and that that's sort of, that's been my, my kind of sweet spot. And um, which is ironic because I'm a total introvert, but, um, um, but I've just, I've been very fortunate at, at U of M. I've had some really wonderful collaborators uh, over time that I've been able to work with very deeply on a number of different subjects. And so sometimes it's, colleagues within the Stamp School of Art and Design, sometimes it's other academics in the university, also a number of um, sort of ongoing collaborations in various uh, sort of communities with community partners. Um, and I, I've been able to bring many of these collaborations into teaching as well, um, sometimes quite literally. <laughs> if I, you know, I was collaborating with um, a historian in, American culture, who um, was doing this wonderful work with an oral oral history project uh, with Chicano women in Michigan, and my students were able to sort of connect to the project and do an exhibition design in relation to that. Um, uh, but just, or, or even just collaborating in the classroom and really um, 
helping students understand how hard that is to do it well. And um, Yeja, your, your comments about language, right? You, you were speaking obviously about literal language, but collaboration is all about translation. Um, and uh, even if we're all from the United States, theoretically, <laughs> you know, there's so much cultural translation that goes on. Um, and if I'm collaborating with colleagues in the business school, it's a completely different language. Um, and just bringing those sort of skill sets and, and mindsets and um, it, it's, I think it's just been really um, nourishing for me in my own practice to understand how much my partners are bringing to a project. Um, but it's also, uh, it's also been a very um, helpful reflection for me of what I'm bringing. Um, a lot of times these collaborations help me see what feels like a really obvious, it's so close to me that I can't see it. And in these conversations and in these collaborations, I'm also better able to appreciate what design brings. Um, into some of these projects. And again, they range from, you know, policy to, you know, neighborhood, you know, revitalization to, you know, making humanity scholarship accessible. I mean, they're all across the board. Um, but that sort of constant of, of learning how to work together, how to value multiple contributions and how to see your own value. Um, and it's just been really, um, really interesting and, and rewarding. Um, yeah, there's so many other things I could say, but I'll, <laughs> I'll pause there. But your teaching, Hannah, is so, you're so involved with these other programs at the U of M and in your community. And I think that that brings us to this third um, prompt, which is looking ahead during this time of global upheaval. And also, as I mentioned earlier, this transitional time in the Yale design program. So, I'm curious to hear from you to how best, in your opinion, do we move design education forward? You know, either or both at the undergraduate and graduate level, whatever you're interested in sharing. But like, what are you, what are you thinking about um, changing or uh, expanding or editing out maybe even of your, um, of your curriculum, right, for various classes, be, because of this moment that we're in, and and uh, these these huge shifts that are about to, that, that are taking place. Hannah, I'll go back to you. I guess we're going back and forth. I was going to say I, I can I can jump in sort of where I just left off, right? So um, I, I was just saying how critical I have found just sort of you know how how positive, but also how difficult, uh, or maybe I didn't say that part. Collaboration is. Um, and I think in this moment, um, it's even more difficult and more important, right? So I, you know, I think that we increasingly understand the value of um, bringing together sort of diverse communities. Um, but after you bring them together, what happens, right? How do you, how do you do whether they're sort of co-creating on a project or whether it's, you know, having a diverse cohort in school? Um, there's amazing value to be had, uh, but it's not automatic. It's work. It's hard work. And it's, um, uh, I certainly don't have the answer to that. I've been chipping away at the problem and, and trying to, to do my best to get better at um, some of those soft skill sets of really not only practicing, but teaching, deep listening, and um, helping students sort of understand sometimes even how to use their design tools and mindsets um, just to connect and and communicate with folks and really sort of have have the value of multiple perspectives in a room right they're often in the room and you don't necessarily hear them all or you don't necessarily engage them all um, I certainly that's certainly a work in progress for me um, and I would say that in the context of the pandemic um, the progress we had been making took a huge step backward um, at a time when, in my view, our civic society is even more desperate for our skill sets in these in these arenas. Um, I, I happen one of one of my major sort of creative research projects at the moment is this project with my dear colleague Stephanie Radden called the Creative Campus Voting Project, where we've been working to figure out what art and design can contribute to the ecosystem, which I'm I'm lucky at U of M is is very rich and multifaceted of getting student student age voters to the polls and getting them voting, um, and 
the key to this, you'll not be surprised to hear, the behavioral research is pretty clear, it's all relational, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> having the ability um, to bring people together and finding ways to use design, um, again, not only tools and output, but mindsets to, to sort of create those spaces, you know, to your point, Yeju, like how, how, how can we design those spaces that allow civic participation to happen? Um, how can we think about experience um, in, in these sort of multi-directional ways that, um, that make people feel safe and reassured and, you know, comfortable taking, taking risks of um, sort of social risks, if it were to connect with, with others. Um, that's where a lot of my head is, is right now. Um, I am thinking about two things to that question, Pamela. One thing is, I mean, of course, like, I don't know where the graphic design uh, should be going or I don't know, but um, something that I am, am always trying to do with my, especially with my graduate students, I guess, is to sort of to encourage them to, to think about what the social purpose of their work is. It's very different from almost, I don't know, it, it, it is different from like what they are sort of encouraged to do. As I mentioned uh, in the beginning, it's all about introspection for two years, but then, you know, as, you know, really smart and talented designers, once they're out in the world, you know, where, where do you fit, right? How do you, how do you find, um, how, how do you sort of, um, I don't know, the, 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 when you say, when I say social purpose of your work, I'm not necessarily talking about sort of, you know, just a kind of moral judgment to uh, the design industry or anything like that. It's every person's, uh, every designer's purpose is different, but I think at least being a bit more aware um, and, and even just like interested in how the world works and, and where you fit as a designer in the bigger picture and kind of related to how how we're you know as a citizen getting more and more conscious about what we buy what we eat right like all of these small everyday decisions together collectively like move us in in a direction right but I think as a designer too you you certainly make some kind of impact in your you know, choice in your job and what you make, what kind of projects you take on and how much of your, you know, time and energy you put in and what are you supporting? What are you promoting? How are you engaging the world, right? I think these questions are important and I think not everyone should, you know, I'm not saying everybody should go out and do socially engaged, you know, do socially engaged projects all the time. I'm not saying that, but just, I mean, that I am interested in that and that's what I do. Uh, but I, I think just becoming a little bit more aware of just where you fit and what you create, uh, what that does, right? Uh, so that's, uh, that's one thing, sort of thinking more about social purpose of your work. Um, and the second thing is, well, DEI uh, thing is kind of tricky. I have been, well, for the last two years or more, right? I have been on a, a few DEI belonging committees at Yale. Um, I don't want to go to too much into it, uh, but um, I 
of course, we talk about, you know, expanding our canon and all of these things, but I think I am, one thing I'm frustrated uh, by, and maybe I am interested in really is again, to really think about um, real life. So we can, of course, we can create a more diverse and, and equitable and inclusive environment at school. But then once the students are out in the world, each person has a different social capital and each person has a different um, situation. So how do we, how do we prepare for that? Uh, Right, so I don't, I do not have a have an answer, but um, at least acknowledging the real struggles that, especially people of color or or women uh, have in the real world, or start thinking about that while at school or at least being aware of that. So it's less shocking once you're out in the world. Um, yeah, that's, that is something that I think about uh, that I think is a, maybe a little bit missing in our conversation at school, talking about DEI belonging. Um, yeah. Well, awareness is the first step to uh, most things <laughs> that we deal with yeah. in life. So, yeah. So, um, Nico and Mar wanted us to stop our conversation around this time and take some questions from from the audience. And actually, we t we agreed as a group that we hope that Nico and Mar and Julia and Hillary would actually also, yay! jump into the jump onto the screen and participate in this part of it because they'll have um lots of valuable insights as well so so you guys want to did you did you see some questions that have risen to the to the top for you that you want to pass on um thank you all thank you so much for talking um with us and and for being part of the exhibition um that was so interesting i have a lot of notes and um like highlights and I have lots of questions myself. Um, but I thought maybe we would start with um, the comment from the audience that experience design is so important for all of our work. And perhaps can you each talk about design education from that practice? I think you can take experience design in a sort of broad sense since the person who mentioned that is not um, from the design program, but actually is thinking about it maybe a little bit more abstractly. Um, maybe I, I have a very short answer. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I don't, um, this is, this doesn't represent the perspectives of the group, but I personally, I don't necessarily think of experience design. I just think everything is, everything right. we do just lives on the not only three dimensional, but four dimensional, you know, it's, it's never in a vacuum. In that sense, I think of, ex I said experience, not the sort of the term experience design that people use. Yeah. So for you, Yeju, design and experience design are one and the same thing. Yeah, I mean, if there's experience design, then like, what the rest of design is not about experience i don't know <laughs> like you guys know like we, when you're designing a book you are not how can you not think about you know the 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 experiencing of the book right like flipping the pages how the sort of information and the visual experience and the feeling of like every how everything it, it's, it's an experience Right. Yeah. So I, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, actually, I actually concur. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but I do think it's actually, I think it has been, um, it's not a term that I uh, used before um, probably a few years ago. Um, and I'm, I'm sure the scholarship probably well, well predates that. Um, but I do think it's an interesting and, and perhaps just a helpful framework for helping students who um, oftentimes are very uh, sort of focused on what they're making, right? And they're, they're really thinking about their experience of making and choosing and, and creating form and really helping them. Um, I often talk about sort of getting out from behind your work and take, coming around to the other side, right? And, um, and really, put, you know, doing what I think many of us have always done for many years in design, um, which is really genuinely thinking about what is the experience of the person for whom this is intended. So I, I do think it's been helpful language, um, particularly in an educational context, um, whether that's in the classroom or whether that's in helping colleagues in other disciplines understand what it is that we do, um, often very intuitively as designers. Right. Oh, and one uh, thing about thinking of uh, an experience rather than an object, what that opens up is subjectivity, right? So it is now the relationship between whoever is engaging with that, right? Uh, and the object or, you know, space or whatever. So each person's experience will be different and kind of starting from there and knowing the, there are, multiple multiple perspectives right great thank you um well i also want to thank you for for uh, a really interesting uh, conversation um and i think uh, th there's a couple of questions uh, on the chat. And so one of them is from Luisa Cajun. Um, for Hannah, you mentioned that your understanding of collaboration collaboration has changed. And, uh, and I'm wondering how so. Mm. Did I say that? No. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think, um, I think it's really deepened and um, it's, I'm sorry, I don't know that I have an exa a very articulate answer to this, but I, I think I, I thought of collaboration as, um, sort of give and take and multiple contributions. And I think where collaboration is for me now is truly integrated in ways that make it very hard for me to tease out what my contributions were. Um, I think that's probably the most concise way that I can say it. And, um, and the sort of magic of how you get to that moment, um, you know, part of that I think can be learned and practiced, and part of it is just the chemistry of of the collaborators, and you know, and the, the ways in which you bounce off of each other, and the synergies that are created in those spaces between you. Um, and yeah, I'm seeing somebody saying it really is magic. <laughs> I, I think that's I think that's right. And um, when it when it happens, it it really does. But it is hard work. It, it's much more time consuming and um, and it's often frustrating. <laughs> and, and then it's also delightful. Um, it's kind of all, all of those things together. Anna, do you um, teach collaboration in your in your classroom or do you uh, structure prompts in a way that collaboration is required? Um, both. I, I, I try hard to teach collaboration because it's not really enough to just say like, see ya, go, good luck, collaborate on that. <laughs> um, so, you know, we do certainly do a number of readings and, um, and we do a lot of reflection as well. It's, it's a lot of trial and error. It's a lot of honestly one-on-one -on -one coaching, right? So, you know, kind of working with the team and then working with individuals in the team and trying to, um, I mean, it's a lot of things that don't fall in the realm of what I thought design was, right? <laughs> I feel, um, and honestly, sometimes I feel like I'm in over my head um, in terms of my skill sets. But it really is trying to to sort of surface conversations that aren't always easy and help students navigate them. And um, and it's also it's also really working against um, a lot of strains in 
certainly in this in, in America and, and in academia about sort of individual achievement, um, which is often it's often a really difficult tension um, to manage. But the short answer is yes, I try. There's there's often not enough time um, in this in the in the semester, which is you know 14 weeks and it's gone, right? But um, but I, I do try to spend time if we're going to if I'm expecting collaboration to happen in the class, I really try to teach collaboration. Um, and I'm lucky in that I have several other colleagues at Stamps who also do this work. Um, and so together we're raising the bar slowly. <laughs> yeah. Well, Yeshu, your class for the exhibition design is collaborative for sure and a challenge I know often, right? And the class that probably one of the most influential classes that I took uh, at Yale was the community action class um, with Donald and Donald um, Moffat and Marlene McCarty. And that was very collaborative and it was really hard too, but it was you know, one of the most important pieces of my design education for sure. I learned a lot from that collaborative process. But I think it is really hard to teach it. You have to experience it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, it's, it's I definitely yeah. guide on the side, right? It's maybe, you know, yeah, maybe I should learn from Hannah how to teach collaboration. <laughs> I, or, or we can get together and talk about how difficult it is. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I don't know if there's I actually don't think there's like one way of collaboration uh i mean even in our work too with different collaborators we work differently right i do have a, a work uh partner and and friend who's a, a frequent collaborator and he and i literally not only design things together but we write emails together as a <laughs> uh so with that kind of collaboration um but then there are, there are all kinds of different um, ways of collaborating with people. And I think what is really exciting and, and challenging at the same time is to, to come up with that process that's, mm -hmm. that works for that situation and for you. And I think, at least for me, my exhibition design class giving again, like having that opportunity to start from nothing and somehow, you know, you do have a starting point and the, the end point because the thesis show should happen, but then everything else in between is really up to them. There are, you know, and I believe that they, uh, the students come up with, eventually always come up with the, with, ways that work for them instead of just me telling them like this is how you collaborate right we have a question from Yung Jai Choi um what skills do you think are necessary for your students that you yourself do not have or maybe something that you struggle with wow that list is long for me <laughs> I was thinking the same thing <laughs> Wait, you want to jump in, Pamela? <laughs> uh, so what do, what I don't have, what we don't have that students should have? Is that the question? Mm -hmm. I would say be free from fear of jumping into new technologies. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely one I do not have. <laughs> um, I mean, I uh, the technologies obviously are changing constantly. So um, the skill set there, I think, is not any any particular kind of technology, but that willingness to jump in and and learn and find your way, um, I think, is is a really critical skill. Which also again starts with awareness, right? If you are uh, aware that you yourself don't have that skill set to find a collaborator, to find a teacher, to reach out for help, so that a you can realize what it is that you're envisioning, or b that you get the assistance you need to actually forge ahead 
<laughs> with yeah. some some new skill sets. Yeah. Yeah. I, I model that for my students all the time because inevitably once a class I say, hello, can anyone help me do X? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but I do, I actually, I actually think that's an important skill set also is being willing to to your to your point, Pamela, to sort of um, admit, you know, what you need and and to let others help you also because that that is often a really key piece of moving things forward. Yeah. I have I the thought of one thing. This is something maybe I had when I was at school, but lost um, and kind of related to everything that we talked about, or, or at least I said, is I'm always amazed by artists and designers who just make, who just make things without being asked or like for no reason, just keep sketching and making and just creating. Um, and I think in our first year in the graduate program, like, you know, it is very loose in that way. You have prompts and you, you generate things. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of like iterative making leads, to, it, you have to kind of like trust the process and like keep making things to, to get somewhere. But now I, um, I feel like I'm the kind of person who who's always questioning why why something has to even a, a project like is this worth existing even like why am I doing what I'm doing so like I need to be convinced that this is like worthwhile or something or like what kind of impact it, it is it making is it positive who is you know like who's who's influenced by this why what is this for, right? So like, I need to have the, the justification <laughs> before uh, making things. I don't know. I mean, it's, good, it's hey. good and bad at the same time. Taking away some of those critical filters that you uh, amassed in your in yeah, yeah in your in your right. design education, but also in your practice. But yeah. it reminds me of that lovely essay I I quite like by Leo Leone that that the urge to make things right. Mm -hmm. It's such a sweet little essay, and it speaks so much to that. And he you know I think was somebody who embodied that he he. Um, made lots of different kinds of things right it's a nice essay to give to, to introductory to design students, I think. So I we're at 730 and although I know that this conversation could go on and on, I wish it could go on more, but we wanted to be respectful of everybody's time. I, um, I didn't know exactly how many questions we would get to and so I asked Hana and Yeji, Yeji to think about you know, sort of like the fantasy dinner party, if there was any uh, class or any um, any person in particular that they would love at this point in their career to take a class from. So I won't, uh, I won't ask them to answer it, but I just think it was a fun question to kind of think about and, um, and maybe for the audience as well, right? Wherever you are in your uh, design education, whether you're, you know, just started college or you're you know way out into your professional practice right what's missing um in your mind right at this moment and how can you kind of address that so and also just um a reminder i think every for everyone to kind of pay attention to what's going to happen in the yale program in the next uh six months to watch from a distance or uh, close up wherever you are and um it's going to be really exciting i think so with that, I don't know, Mar, do you wanna, do you wanna say anything in closing or? Just to thank everybody for attending and for and to the panelists for uh, participating and reminding you that our last panel uh, in this series is next Monday uh, with uh, Miko. Uh, uh, Lodi, Mar, I'm gonna- Marwanga. Marwanga. <laughs> and, uh, and Betty Wang, a uh, student who will be moderating that session. So we hope to see you then. And I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, um, but thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good everyone. night. <laughs>